Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 160. This episode is with Marcello Haynes. So, a little backstory. My wife's aunt gifted us this really cool trip on a gondola a while ago, and we had such a good time, and the gondolier rowing the boat was so interesting that I asked him to come on the show, and he said yes. Marcello is great. We talk about driving from Florida to Rhode Island, where he's from, how he became a gondolier, going to Italy for the first time, the technique of rowing a gondola, what it's like being a small business owner, how he was once a high school physics teacher, what brought him down to Naples, and so much more. So, uh, hey, let's just jump right into this one, friends. Without further ado, please enjoy this episode of The Interesting Podcast, number 160, with Marcello Haynes. How about a little theme song action? Yeah, right. A yeah. long last. That's right. How's your day going? It's going great. It's been a day. Yeah. I, um, I went, I was up in outside of Boston at eight o'clock this morning to check out a guy's two gondolas. Oh, uh, there you go. There used to be gondolas operating up in Boston and they closed a few years ago. So thinking about adding their boats. There you go. The fleet. We'll see. Right and. On. I'm the co-owner of a kayak company up here and opening weekend is Saturday. So I had to there install a new kayak launcher and then uh, I drove straight to a park so that I could, you know, hang out in the shade sure. and chat with you. There you go. I'm into that. It's not, it's not a bad way to start the day per se. No, not at all. Right on, right on Boston. You know, I think I've, I've been through Boston, but I've never spent any actual time there, but I know you're in Rhode Island, right? Yep. Yep. How far are you from Boston? It's about an hour. Right on, right on. How was the drive? From from Florida or? Yeah. Oh, man. It, uh, <laughs> it's that brutal. Good, huh? <laughs> I, I drove the first boat back and then had a couple of days. But with the second boat, I drove the empty trailer down, got the boat, took a nap, and pretty much turned right around and drove back again. So I was... Oof. By the time I got back to Rhode Island, I'd been on the road for like 60 out of 75 hours. And oh, God. Yeah. Uh, it was brutal. Were you by yourself? Uh, well, I'm never by myself when I have the interesting podcast to listen to, <laughs> you know, for 60 hours on the road. Yeah. In that case, I owe you an apology. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was great. I got to listen to a, a bunch of a bunch of your a bunch of your episodes, which was just great. And, uh, you know, audio books. I'm, uh, I'm the president of the board for our local library. Oh, cool. Uh, in town. And so big fan of the library. So I always borrow a bunch of audio books for my, my drives up and down the Eastern seaboard. And, you know, I have two little kids and an incredible wife at home and I am addicted to spending time with them. But at the same time, it's kind of nice to have 28 to 30 hours just sure. to myself to sure. think, solve the world's problems. Of course, of course. One at a time. One at a time. Yeah, I'm working on it. <laughs> How long is that drive from Naples to what part of Rhode Island? Are you? Um, we are west of Providence. The, west the of town Providence. is called Foster. We're not known for anything other than, you know, the amount of snowfall that we get in the winter and uh, no school of Foster Gloucester is kind of a running joke in, hey. in Rhode Island. <laughs> and the gondoliers that we create, you know, of a, course, a third of the a third of the workforce comes from Foster. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, those are two good things to have under your belt. It works. <laughs> but yeah, it takes me without a trailer or anything. It'll take us about twenty four hours driving time. Wow. With a trailer, twenty eight. With a boat on trailer, about thirty. Oh. Uh, and that's just driving. You know, I got to yeah. stop for naps along the way. We have friends in North Carolina, so. Nice. Usually try and make it to North Carolina, and it's almost exactly halfway. Mm -hmm. So if I can make it the fourteen or fifteen hours, uh, make it there, have a a meal and a beer, and take a nap, usually in that order. Sure. <laughs> and then you know get back on the road again, whichever way I'm going. Yeah. Make it home. 
I don't think I've ever driven that long of a time. Like I, I, I drove with my brother to North Carolina where I'm from and it was like a 13, 13 and a half hour drive straight through. We just took shifts. I've been yeah. in a car for that long. Like as a kid, we took road <laughs> trips from like Naples to Niagara Falls. And that was, that's, you know, that's pretty far a trek, but yeah, right. it's, are, are you, do you get car sick ever? No, that's good. No, I, I never get car sick. My wife does. She usually insists on driving whenever we go anywhere. Yeah. Mine too. Um, Same thing. Yeah. Super car sick all the time. We got to take drama me. And if we go to Orlando. Yeah. You I know? mean, I'm an incredible driver. She does yeah. not get sick with me. She just likes to drive. I think there you go. Term, uses <laughs> it as a convenient excuse. Sure. Do you just take the interstates all the way up? For the most part, yeah, I'll stay yeah. on 95 up to a certain point, depending upon where I am. Yeah, mm -hmm. I really want to avoid traffic in D.C. and New York. And so sense. if I think that I'm going to hit D.C. at anything close to a rush hour, I'll cut over to like 77 or 75 and go up into Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and then work my way over. Gotcha. Uh, my dad was a truck driver for years. Oh, mine too. Know, and, yo, very cool. Hey, yeah, does is he like my dad where he has still has the atlas and it's in his know, head I'll tell him that i'm driving out somewhere and be like well let's take out the atlas and uh you know map out the route my dad so, just closes his eyes he's like hold on <laughs> all right <laughs> does he, he probably can't still conjure up or maybe just sense i feel like it's going to be some uh, exactly he just like yeah. puts his finger in his mouth and holds it up to the wind He's what like, time are you leaving again? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're going to want to take 17. I'm telling you yeah. right now. Okay, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> yep. My dad's the same way. Yep. Oh, yep. S same guy who tells me how to use the table saw every time I help him. It's like he still sees me as being seven years old. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, he just can't get it out of his head now. Yeah. You, know, you got to watch out for this part. <laughs> this is the part that'll take your finger off. Got it, Dad. Thanks. Yep. Yep. I I'm at the point now where I just let him do it. And I'm like, can you show me again? How does that? Oh, <laughs> yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I pretty much do the same thing because, yeah. you know, I, I think it's just easier than trying to explain. It saves so much time. It times. <laughs> saves so much time. My, see, you know what my biggest problem is? He's always right. And it, it's infuriating. Like when I'm working on a car and I'm like, is it working? He goes, well, you're doing it wrong. You just got to move the wrench like this. I was like, that's what I'm doing. He's like, no, you're not. You're not. You need to get the leverage. I'm like, I'm doing the leverage. And he just, bink in one try and i've been fighting for like 45 minutes it's infuriating yeah. my my mom was a teacher my dad a cabinet maker by trade oh, and cool. i have a younger brother and we Same. both very much got like my brother got my mother's personality i got my dad's my brother got my dad's brain i got my mom's you know, uh -huh. i have the teacher brain you know my brother and my dad can look at the pile of wood and see the cabinet or see the bench or whatever it is. I just see the wood. Sure. <laughs> and I see you can rub it, rub it together really fast and make a nice fire with it. That's right. Um, but, you know, my mom and I were both teachers and at one time and, you know, definitely teacher brain. I remember my dad, uh, this is one of my great memories of my dad, who, you know, loves me unconditionally and always will but we were i think we were tiling a floor together in their porch and you know i screwed up something i can do what my dad and my brother do it just takes me like three or four times i have to measure everything that many times yep. you know just yep. to make sure it's perfect and <laughs> same, same he uh I, I did something stupid he says you know what you know, don't take us the wrong way because I love you more than anybody else in the world. <laughs> but you better make your money using your head and not your hands. <laughs> I can see the effort. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's a good try, pal. But uh, yeah. <laughs> and so he always laughs that I ended up a gondolier and not, you know, really a thinker. I mean, I'm a small business owner, so I'm kind of thinking all the time and solving problems. But sure. Um, you know, it's, he always laughs that I didn't end up making my money using my head. Yeah. Still using my hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. You, you've got both sides, which is good. The question yeah. is, though, can your brother sing? He can. Oh, um, man. So, and he's a gondolier with me, actually. Oh, no way. Island. Yeah. So uh, he is one of the gondoliers from Foster. Uh, oh, hometown. perfect. So, yep. Yeah. And... So I have been running the business up north. This will be my 
14th year, 15th season. And wow. He's been rowing with me. He didn't row last year uh, for COVID related reasons. Fair. But he's rowed for 12 or 13 seasons. All but all but my first season. Wow. He moved home and yep. And that's cool. Another guy who I trained that same year, my second year running the show, he is my confirmation sponsor's son. He went to my mother's preschool, you know, cool. like family from the beginning. And he actually ended up marrying my sister-in-law. So he actually is family. Oh, perfect. Well, yeah. <laughs> there you right. go. You know, if his younger brother rose, you know, and he, uh, I mean, they don't sing as well as I do. But yeah, uh, of course, of course. Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> they're no, they're they're very, very good. I'm I'm very impressed with the overall talent level of the Providence Gondolier. You know, there's about 15 of us up here. Wow. And yeah. And, you know, they're very, very good. They really are. That's so, cool. 15. That's a lot. Yeah. It's well, we are a lot busier also up in Providence than in Naples. We've oh, been really? operating up here for over 20 years. So uh, that you know, makes it's sense. very much, you know, Providence is a very Italian American city and, you know, we lend authenticity to that culture and it lends authenticity to us. And, you know, we end up with uh, 2,500 or more trips a season, pushing 3,000 a season up here in six months. Yeah, whereas Goodness I think we gracious. did about 700 and change down in Naples in four months. So, you know, I looked at all of us, you know, the eight or so guys that we had, you know, at the end of the summer, Mm -hmm. you know late august before the teachers went back to school we were all just exhausted and so we've I been bet. actively trying to find more gondoliers so over the last three seasons before covid we picked up i think nine nine rowers three each season so wow that's I always trying to have a a pot of one or two you know, yeah it's a way to go in the, just in, in case the mix. <laughs> <laughs> it's insurance if nothing else <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah and it's just trying you know I'm a small business owner, always trying to make sure that the business is operating as well as possible. And it doesn't, it doesn't do us any good for us all to be exhausted. So, sure. Sure. And especially for what we do, you know, everybody kind of needs to be on their game as much as they can. And yeah, I always tell them it doesn't have to be necessarily the best trip that you're ever going to give. Just give the best trip that you can at that moment. You know, if it's your ninth trip of the day, just give the best trip you can. And sure. I can't fault you for that. But, you know, at least now with 15, it's a much more like people work as much as they want. I'm not right. kind of leaning on everybody like, I'm not really sure you can go on vacation right now, to be honest with you. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, that that's neat, though. I didn't realize that Foster had such like a, an Italian influence. That's neat. Especially yeah, being so close to uh, Boston, because Boston's known for it's like Irish big time. This is Boston. But also Italian. I mean, it also has a, an Italian section called the North End. We have our section called Federal Hill. And the we had, I'd say, three major waves of immigration. The Irish came first during mm -hmm. the Irish famine, 1840s and 50s. But the Italians were coming for decades from like the 1880s with the unification of Italy through about the 19-teens, the end of World War I. Right and on. that's still our, I'd say, largest kind of ethnic group. It's our only ethnic quarter is the Italian quarter. Gotcha. So did you grow up with that kind of like Italian influence? Um, so here's where I admit freely that Marcello was a given name. It just didn't happen to be given to me when I was born. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, where I grew up, the, the town of Foster is pretty rural. It's out on the border with Connecticut and, you know, 100 people per square mile. Oh. Um, which is pretty rural for Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And there aren't a lot of Italians, or at least there weren't when I was growing up. Sure. And having said that, you know, there are a number of, of things that I like to tell people on the boat. One is that, you know, I wasn't born Italian, but I became Italian along the way. Perfect. And the <laughs> other one is I was actually Italian for about a month of my life. And there's a, there's a story behind that. I, we have always thought that we were about 60% French through Canada, about 30% British Isles, about 10% Scandinavian, and maybe a little tiny bit of American Indian for flavor. Sure. Why and not? a few years ago, I asked for a DNA kit for Christmas. 
Cool. And because this is how fast life moves for a gondolier, I didn't send the sample in until April. Um, <laughs> standard, standard. Right, exactly. <laughs> I got the information back in May, which is during the gondola season up north. And it says we're 6% French instead of 60. So that was obviously a big difference. Oh. About 50% British Isles. So, you know, that that was all right. And then Check 12% out. Scandinavian, which made sense. 12% Iberian Peninsula, so Spanish and Portuguese. Nice. And 15% Southern Europe. There you which is go. Italy and Greece. Now, I am ecstatic. Yeah. Because <laughs> you've for got 19 receipts. years, right? <laughs> for 19 years, I told everybody on the boat, no, I actually am not Italian. I, uh, I don't have a drop of Italian blood. And here it turns out, Aha! Like 15% Italian. There you and then go. Uh, about a month later, I get another email from Ancestry.com that says, hey, we've updated your information. You know, your DNA doesn't change, but uh, the oh, science no. behind it does. And as it turns out, we're 60% French through Canada. We're 30% British <laughs> Isles. We're 10% Scandinavian, maybe a little tiny bit of American Indian. So, you know, we are what we thought we were. And they took away everything interesting. So, oh, no. <laughs> but, but they can never take away that I was Italian for a month of my life. That's right. You have the printout and everything to prove it. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> you know what's funny? A very similar thing happened to me. So okay. we grew up thinking we were Irish. And oh. always said that we were Irish and I have an orange beard. It's like, all right, it's there. This right, is Irish. Yeah, you definitely look it, Irish. You know, my grandmother had red hair. My aunt had red hair. It's like, okay, all right, cool. It's there. It makes sense. So I took a DNA test as well. I did the, I did ancestry. Uh -huh. And uh, the first test that we got back, it was like 54% England, Wales, and Northwestern Europe, 37% Ireland and Scotland. Uh -huh. And then it was like 6% Norway, 3% Germanic Europe. I was like, all right, cool. 37. That's a lot for Ireland right. and Scotland. So right. then six months later, same thing. And such was like, hey, listen, so we've got better technology. We can further pinpoint. And uh, it's actually 36% Scottish. I was like, what? What? No, I'll wait six more months and hope it turns back. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not Irish at all. They took away. They took it away. The 37 they the Irish Scottish went to just Scottish. Yeah, they flipped it. They flipped it. Gotcha. Now, I have trust issues now. Um, so, you know, we'll wait another year and check back in and see if they, see if they sure. made another one. Yeah, I've checked mine since, but uh, no, they haven't. Yeah, nothing yet. Italian back in. <laughs> we can hold out I'm hope. Still not Italian. Right, exactly. <laughs> they did right. add 2% Irish for me, too. So Oh, there you go. And I, yeah, and I, I play uh, Irish field hockey, hurling. Oh, nice. I've heard of it. Yeah. yeah. So there's a club here in Providence. And so, you know, I, I row a gondola and I'm not Italian and I play <laughs> hurling and I'm not Irish, but you know, I do okay. love both, both things. Very you know much. what you're doing? You're earning your way in. Right, That's what's right. happening. <laughs> exactly. I think it's like 25 years. A gondolier automatically gives you a percentage of Italian. Exactly. I just became Italian <laughs> along the way, you know? Yeah. It, I'll give I it lived to you. in a very Italian town, and I was kind of like the Henry Hill of the the little group, yeah. you know, the <laughs> the token non Italian guy yeah. in the the little group. But yep. I um, yeah, we I, at this point, I've rode the gondolas for over twenty years. I sing the songs, oh. I speak the language, I love the food. I am more Italian than a lot of my Italian friends. I would say yeah. most of my Italian friends. Are. Yeah, I'll give it so. to you. Have you you've been to Italy? Seven times. Nice. Yep. How cool yeah, was five that times, the first time? Oh, oh, the first time was to Venice. I Ooh. had been rowing with my bosses for, I think it was in between my third and fourth seasons rowing. Cool. And I had never been abroad except to Canada. Um, and they oh, were going cool. to Venice and they took me along kind of like a, a bonus, you know, if you will. And it was just amazing. You know, one of the two greatest, you know, non-wedding day babies being born moments yeah. in my life is rowing under the Rialto Bridge on the Grand Canal at like 22 years old. Oh, you got yeah, to row was, there? Yes, I did. Yep. Dude. So my best friend in all of Italy um, is a gondolier there. And he just retired after 50 years when the pandemic hit. He said enough wow. is enough. But he is the guy who trained my old boss how to row. So 
Oh, uh, my my old bosses introduced me to him, and you know we've been friends also ever since for over twenty years. And so every time we go, and I've taken of the seven trips, five have just been to Venice. Cool. And when we go, I always try and get to row with him. You know, one day we'll just take out the boat alone. And then once we'll take, uh, you know, our families out cruising around and, oh my word, it's just incredible. Really? That's, yeah. I mean, it's gotta be, you're in like the home. Yeah, exactly. You know, going to Venice for a gondolier is like you know, a pilgrimage Yeah. To, to a holy city. So it really is the homeland, you know, the, the harbor of my soul, you know, it is pulling me back the moment I turn away from it. I, yeah. Yeah. I've already told my wife, if she dies young, I'm taking the kids and moving to Venice. <laughs> she won't have any part of it. So we, That's we right. definitely cannot do it. It's not uh, a bad plan. It's not right. a bad plan. <laughs> as far as contingencies go. <laughs> I can do English tours in English to the, yeah. to the visitors. There's plenty of English tourists. Exactly. I wouldn't be allowed to row there. Yeah. Uh, even, yeah. After, even after rowing for 20 years. You know, when, when, when we go rowing, Dante and I, I do not wear stripes. Ah, smart. Um, it's a blood in, yep. blood out streets over there. Regular clothes. Yep. They, uh. They are very proud of their tradition, and rightfully so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, he is—he has told me I roll well enough to be a Venetian, which is, you know, high praise. Yeah, from coming from one of them. So definitely, De see, you're you, you're getting in by proxy. It works exactly. It works yep. as and long as you're I in the door. There, yeah, <laughs> they, they know. They know. They know <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So when you you've been doing it for so long, how old were you when you started? I was twenty years old when I started. Nice. I was in college. It was the summer after junior year of college. And I was looking for a summer job. I was, so I went to college in Pennsylvania and I was back home in Rhode Island looking for a summer job. And, you know, each year my parents would say, we need X thousands of dollars or you're not going back to Lehigh. So, you know, I sat around mm -hmm. for a few weeks and they're like, oh, clock's ticking. So <laughs> I uh, made a list of temp agencies because I'd worked in a warehouse the year before and nice. I went to the first one on my list. And she did not have anything well paying enough for me to go back to school, but I happened to mention that I joined the crew team. And ah. she looks at me and she says, crew means rowing, right? I said, yes, it does. And she said, well, I was at a job fair at Providence College a couple of weeks ago when there was a company looking for gondoliers. And I was like, sign no me way. up. It was my dream job. Yeah. And this was so long ago that she did not have the internet on her computer. So, <laughs> which is a long time ago. Yeah. So... We were looking through the yellow pages, trying to find a gondola company. And it's here, if I have millennials on board, and I'm telling them the story, the yellow pages was a big, thick book that we had yeah. to look for <laughs> businesses in. You may remember it from your grandparents' house, you know, trying to get yeah. up to the table. So we uh, can't, couldn't find it anywhere. But I said, don't worry, I will find this number. I went home, I called Providence City Hall. I got bounced around until someone put me through to our very Italian mayor's office. Get it. And he had been instrumental in my old boss's starting the company in the first place. So oh. his, uh, his assistant knew, knew the number right off the bat. So I call the phone number. The voice on the other side says, you're hired. You can come down and start training tomorrow. Get it. And I get there and it's my boss and I and two boats. And the guy that he had trained the year before hadn't worked out. So he needed somebody as soon as possible. And there I was. Dude, was, yeah. there, a, was there a learning curve? There is always a learning curve. Yeah. <laughs> there is nothing that prepares. You know, I'd love to say that I was a natural and took right to it, <laughs> but no, I, you know, I got a leg wet the first day, just pushing away from the dock. <laughs> and good sign. Good a sign. number of guys have gone in during training. It's better to just get it out of your system during training. But I, I'd say it's not, it's not, you know, crazy. I'd say you probably need about 20 or 30 hours of serious water time yeah. before you're ready to take out people, real people, um, in ideal conditions, you know, perfectly sure. calm conditions. And then from there, there's a lot of on the job training. You're kind of testing yourself against a wind or a current or something that you're just not quite comfortable with. Sure. You're just pushing yourself a little bit harder. Have you ever fallen out? Um, we, in over 20 years, we've had two gondoliers go in on trips, Oh no! Uh, <laughs> including my brother-in-law, um, <laughs> one of them. Perfect. Perfect. But I, it took me 15 years, but I did actually fall in, but it was right at the dock 
you know, doing something that I'd done hundreds of times before, you know, it's just one of those things. And I actually fell in in Florida too. Oh, uh, <laughs> halfway. Perfect. Yeah, just halfway. Yep. Perfect. Put myself on the on that lip. Legs went in. Pulled myself right back out again, and just kept wiping down the boat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got to earn it a little bit. You know right. what I mean. You have to. Yeah. Ta- every gondolier has to taste the water at least once. Right. Exactly. We every time you you like almost you know you kind of lose your balance a little bit and you get that <gasps> moment yeah. where you yeah. you almost fall in. We we. The guys like to say it's the, the river whispering your name, you know, yes. and she's going to claim you eventually. And that's why it's better to just fall in during training. I agree. Out of the way. I agree. <laughs> How long did it take before your arms stopped being sore? It's, it is definitely, it's a movement that you just don't do a lot. Yeah. So like your shoulders, especially my mm-hmm. My crew coach was thrilled when I came back. Well, pluses and minuses. I, yeah. <laughs> I didn't have shoulders when I yeah. <laughs> when I left the group team for the season for the summer. So I came back with shoulders. He was pretty, pretty happy about that. But I had lost 15 or 20 pounds too. So he wasn't Ooh. thrilled with that. But um, it's shoulders. You'll definitely feel it in your shoulders when you first start. Mm-hmm. And you're very... A lot of people are very uncomfortable with just standing on a boat you know, with water underneath you and just oh, the sure. fact that you're rocking a little bit. So you get really tired actually in your legs because all these muscles are shooting off because ah. they don't know what to do. You know, they're just not stable. Right. And that is something that really, I think, makes us tired in the very early going. Plus, you're very inefficient with the way that you row. I mean, I've told the rookies, if I if I rowed the way that they did, I'd be dead by now. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> They're just, you know, drenched in sweat after 45 minutes to an hour of rowing because, you know, they're just not doing it right. And they're thinking so much about it and their muscles just, you know, aren't working the way that they want them to. So they're fighting, they're using muscles to fight muscles and their, you know, legs are twitching. And it's a, it's a lot of energy burned in a short amount of time when you first get going. Sure. But, you know, like anything, you're refining a technique and the better you get, the more efficient you become with the motion of your body. And finally, the last step is learning to control your body through space so that the boat doesn't rock. All right. Keep it as still as possible. Yep. That is, that comes from when I was living in that Italian town, Johnston, mm-hmm. I was singing in the choir at church and our choir director would come to this cultural event that Providence has called Waterfire every year. I don't know if Ooh, we talked about that on the boat or a, not. That's a great name. Yeah, Waterfire is it's really very cool. If you ever get the chance to visit Rhode Island, totally worth checking it out. Yeah. Uh, they didn't have it all year last year for COVID. They're hoping to have it sometime in 20, 2021. But basically, if you can picture over the course of about a half a mile of river walk, um these large metal baskets about the size of a fire pit that you could buy for your backyard. Uh-huh. And they're floating in the middle of the river, about 30 feet apart. What? And Oh yeah. And for about a half a mile, there's about 85 or 90 of these baskets. And periodically about twice a month, they'll fill them with wood and they uh, light them on fire. They play music the whole length of the river walk. They keep feeding the fires. Like the music what? starts at, sunset and goes until 12 30 in the morning and it's spectacular it's primal it's yeah. fascinating you know the smell of the smoke and the sound of the sparks and the music and the kind of kind of low rustle of people's conversations Fifty thousand people all having these hushed conversations it's really something to behold wow that sounds yeah. so cool it, it's really very cool uh, worst time to take a gondola trip, but it's, <laughs> it ups the stakes a whole lot. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it just takes away from everything that we normally do. You know, we yeah. all sing a little bit in Italian. We get a lot of visitors, you know, who want us to kind of hit the highlights and point out things along the way. You know, you can add a musician on board, you know, all the regular stuff just falls by the wayside. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it becomes a survival stuff. game. <laughs> oh yeah. Exactly. That is exactly what it is. A survival game. But 
anyway, this uh, this choir director used to, used to go to this event with his wife every time they would have it. And I could always pick him out of a crowd of 50,000 because there he'd be leaning over, waving with his arms as I was rowing by. And I'd come staggering into church after work until two or three o'clock in the morning the previous day. He's like, Marcello, <laughs> I can always tell when it's you rowing instead of your boss because the boat never rocks. There you and go. The way that my boss rowed the boat would rock with every stroke, just slightly, the way that he wrote. And I said, all right, you know, if one person out of 50,000 notices that the boat doesn't rock, then the boat should never rock. And so that is kind of the last test of new gondoliers, is being able to make sure that you control yourself so well that the boat doesn't rock. Interesting. I never thought there's so much pressure on your legs, but it makes so much sense. Because looking it really at is. it, you're like, oh, it's just rowing. It's all arms. But it's like, no. Because, yeah, no. the boat is so temperamental. Same it's, thing it's with crew. Close. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I told people that I rode crew. They're like, oh, your arms would be enormous. But, you know, the arms are part of the stroke just because we have arms. If we didn't have arms, we would still be able to row. Right. It's it's all legs and back. A wow. lot of core for gondoliering. Yep. And it's very meditative. As long as the wind isn't blowing. Sure. You know, really, really strongly. You know, it's just kind of, it's almost like doing Tai Chi. You know, your body's kind of constantly and slowly moving forward, moving back, arms moving up, moving down, you're breathing in and out. It's, especially if you get, you know, the lovey-dovey couple late in the evening and all you have to do is shut up and row. Sure. It's this really meditative experience, I find. That's cool. I didn't realize there's like so much technique involved. It makes sense that there is, but that you just something you wouldn't realize on face value. Right. Right. It's, and it's something that, you know, people just, that's the point. I yeah. don't want people to see how difficult it is. I want them to think that it's easy. That, that means that I have trained gondoliers and they have honed their skill so well. Yeah. That people think that, and that's good. That's good to me. That, yeah, it's it's almost an art. It's like uh, right. when you see like swordsmen and stuff like that. They're just making right. a cut, and you're like, "There's like eight parts to that that you're not seeing. You're just seeing the." Whoosh. You're like, "That's exactly, man." If they make it look easy, they're really good. Yeah, that's the idea. You know, it's supposed to look easy, even when we're, you know, even when the wind is blowing. You know. Yeah. The idea is for you to simply feel like you know you're in your living room with. The travel channel set to Providence or Naples in high def. <laughs> is the water is the water ever deep? Um, not where we row. Yeah, uh, it's tidal, so you yeah. know the deepest it gets is probably like maybe ten or twelve feet. Sure. The most shallow. I mean, we it gets down to like eighteen inches in some spots at low tide, but um, it really doesn't matter one way or the other. You know, right. It's it's shallowness that matters. You know, we can row in a foot of water, right? But it's not ideal. You ideally want to have about two or three feet for the oar. Oh yeah, to use the oar most effectively. But beyond that, you know, two feet deep is the same as twenty feet deep or two hundred feet deep. You know, right. Just rowing on the surface. So, have you or anyone you know ever lost an oar? Yes, which is oh. why we keep two oars on the boat now. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> but, Lessons learned the hard way, I imagine. Yep. The uh, My brother-in-law, when he went in um, <laughs> on his trip, you know, he he was a life uh, a lifeguard in an earlier life. And, that helps. Know, so he kind of goes into lifeguard, life-saving mode and he pops up out of the water and he goes, boat, no, or, you know, so he swims over and gets the oar, <laughs> brings it back, you know, pops himself back onto the boat. He had four, you know, beautiful Southern Belle African-American women on board. I think they're from Georgia or something. And they're, they're like, we can't swim. We can't swim. And uh, don't, like, worry, don't man. worry about it. We're going to be fine. <laughs> yep. I'm part they were laughing and taking pictures the whole rest of the time. Uh, we've snapped oars out there, though. Um, oh, no. Oh, yeah, yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and how heavy are those boats? Each one weighs about a thousand pounds. Oh. And then, you know, 
the passengers as well, which, you know, if you have six passengers, they might outweigh the boat. Yeah. Um, oh, so man. Get... Yeah. That's when oars become toothpicks. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you, could, you could definitely feel it, you know, if you're, you know, pushing against the wind and you got a large group on board, you know, the, the oar flexes, you know. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, come on, baby. Hold together. Yeah. <laughs> you got this. If not, I have another one just in case. <laughs> Right, just in case. Of course, the second one is always the spare. So yeah. It's not as good as the first one. It's the you donut or. So, right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so if we're going to break the good one, then you really got to take it easy with the second one. Oh, but man. Still, it's good to have the spare. Have you ever been rained on? Absolutely. Oh, boy. Um, what do you do? Um, Row faster? Find a bridge? Yeah, you find the bridge. Ah. And in Florida, I mean, the two seasons that I've been down there have just been spectacular. It's, it's the dry season. I think it has rained mm -hmm. five times each season. Yeah, you know, we've seen rain five times. Sure. And that's incredible. In Rhode Island, you know, it can come and go. But we also have a number of bridges. We row under four bridges in each direction. So we're never that far away from a bridge. And in the summertime, if we get hit, it's usually a passing thunderstorm you know five or ten minutes or something and we just hang out under the bridge and we sing a few extra songs you know have a little impromptu concert and get Perfect. back to it we always have umbrellas on board just to be safe smart yeah smart. and once upon a time you know 20 years ago my my mom or you know my brother-in-law's mom would call us say because we because they live in foster half an hour west of the city and that is where our weather is usually coming from that direction so they're mm -hmm. like ah we're just getting hit by a kind of a major cell here just uh passing it on uh, yeah <laughs> so <laughs> hold fast so that that was good to know but now you know with weather apps we ah. can we can always check the radar if it's iffy you know we can always just check and see and be like eh, you know maybe we should postpone this reservation or something like that you know right That's it's a lot smart. easier yeah we don't get caught out in the rain nearly as frequently as as we did in years past that helps that helps yeah. Did, so you've been doing it for so long has the experience evolved or has it always been like you take the gondola you find bridges there's singing involved like has it always been that way or have you added these things as it's gone on um the the basics of every trip has pretty much been the same yeah but i've also refined you know the knowledge the songs Sure. The technique in the in the same way that I've refined the technique. I mean, when I started rowing, my old boss had only been rowing for two seasons. So he was practically a rookie himself. Right. You know, and here I come in and we canceled more trips because of the wind than because of the rain back then. Oh. But you know, now, you know, I'm at the point where I could row through a small craft advisory. Get you know, it. and have a number of guys who can do the same after a number of years of rowing. So our our ability to row has definitely increased. And then the trip has never been cookie cutter, mm -hmm. you know? So a, let's say a family of five from Iowa sure. might get a very different trip than a family of five from East Providence. Right. Um, you know, they might be interested in different things. You know, the family of five from Iowa, their whirlwind tour of the Northeast, you know, they want as much information that we can tell them about Providence or if they're down in Florida about Naples and, you know, the family, the local family, you know, maybe we're just swapping stories about, you know, travel that we've done together and things we've done with our kids and, you know, things like that. And, um, you know, if that couple, you know, who have three kids at home get a date night, you know, they're celebrating having a babysitter, which a lot of people do celebrate. Mm -hmm. Um, then that's also a very different experience. And if that couple went on a double date, you know, that would be a different experience, you know? So we just kind of reading our audience. Actually, there's a great story from one of my, one of my long time guys has been with us I think nine or 10 seasons up in Rhode mm -hmm. Island. And on one of his first trips, one of the other guys comes back and he says, you've got to have a chat with, and I won't use his name, um <laughs> you gotta have a chat with him i said why what's up i said well i just passed him on a trip and uh on board was this couple 
party of two who are passionately kissing each other. And <laughs> this rookie is like, and on your left, you can see the Providence Courthouse. It was built in the 1930s and a depression era project, blah, 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 blah. You know, so again, we always talked about giving the best trip that you can give. And to him, that meant just like vomiting out all the information that he knew about Providence and, you know, singing every song that he knew and he gets back and like, listen, sometimes you just don't need to try that hard. <laughs> and that's all there is to it you know the that couple who have three kids and never get date nights they don't want to hear us talk right they just <laughs> you're there to facilitate to, <laughs> right soak up being together and being quiet and so i think so we've funny. gotten really good <laughs> about being mindful of our patrons you know sure. and making sure that each trip gets the best trip that they can get but that doesn't mean that it's the same trip as the one you gave before it or will give after it you know what i mean sure that's got to keep it interesting as well it's like a like a like a canal uber driver like every person that gets in your boat is different has their own lives has different experiences so you have that that like we have this moment let's and even if they've been even if they're repeat customers you know they want to find out how the last year is going how my kids are doing you know yeah. Uh, or if they're like chatting with another gondolier that they've had before, you know, how, how did he finish college yet? You know, what's his, what, what is he getting for a job? Or is he going to just be a gondolier forever? Um, you know, it's, it really is. Each trip is different because of the people that we have on board. Yeah. And, you know, I'm always learning new songs for my own personal fun and enjoyment. And, you know, I have the ones that I kind of prefer to sing, but Sure. Especially for repeat customers, that's an opportunity for me to break out something in the repertoire that I don't necessarily sing all the time. And um, yeah, it's it's just, for me, the most incredible job. Not only was I a rower, like I said, but I was a history and biology double major. So the historian in me has just loved getting to know all the layers of Providence's history and then Venice's and I'm working on Naples and uh, and then I told you I've been singing, you know, in churches. Yeah. I've been, my mom was choir director when I was a little kid. And oh, perfect. I've been singing for as long as I can remember. So in the, in the Venn diagram of rowing history and singing, there's really only one job that fits in the middle. Yeah. And that's being a <laughs> gondolier. So, you know, I consider myself very fortunate that I found the job that was perfect for me when I was 20 years old. And I yeah. hope to get to do it for a very long time. That's so cool. Like how many on average, how many trips a day do you do? Uh depends on the day. Uh, yeah. I admittedly up here I don't row as much as I used to. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, with 15 gondoliers and sure. being the owner of the business, you know, I make money when I row, they make money when they row, but I also make money when they row. So right. it's most efficient for them to do as much rowing as possible. Totally. But you know, I got to row nine or 10 trips on Sunday, which is my first day rowing back here. And that was awesome. And, you know, we'll, once we get rolling, you Mm -hmm. know, we'll do 15, 20 trips a day during the week up here. We'll do 25 to 35 on Friday and Sunday. And we'll do like 40 or 50 on Saturday. Wow. Yeah. We are, we are jamming. Get it. Again, you know, just trying to make every single person feel like they had the perfect experience that that is my goal if we if we fail on one trip we have failed for the day sure Perfection is the bar totally do you have to like because you you do naples part of the year and then you do rhode island part of the year is there mm-hmm. other places that you've rode as well um i've rode in other places there's a gondola company out in minnesota Oh, still water. And I've gotten to row a trip for him. So we have this event in the gondola community called the U S gondola nationals. Oh, and sweet. Yeah. So it's uh gondola races and Perfect. various, uh, you know, there's distance, there's sprints, there's slalom. Uh, you happen to be in the presence of greatness. I am uh, the reigning solo slalom champion reclaiming my throne beautiful yeah, i'm not exactly. surprised <laughs> <laughs> well you know i i'm definitely getting too old to be able to win the the sprints or the distance now but uh, i can still <laughs> you beat can't the, win them all. the young guns yeah in the, young, in the slalom the slalom is my event perfect and it was created by me for me and <laughs> perfect perfect i'm in I, 
Yeah, the the Providence gondoliers usually do really well because we can practice with water fire baskets. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you know, we have kind of this set up slalom course for us to practice on all the time. Anyway, Perfect. it's kind of like our it's the gondolier annual convention. And, That's cool. You know, so we get to, you know, we get together once a year and it's held by a different uh, gondola company each year. So I've rode out in Newport Beach, California, and Huntington wow. Beach as well. Still water. Um, That's Providence like all over Naples. the place. And then Boston. There are guys that used to operate up in Boston. I've been rowing up there uh, a time or two as well. And there's my inspiration for the future of the company is, I don't know if you've heard of the boat club, Barton and Gray. I have now. So there, there's this, it's this club where you pay however many thousands of dollars to join and then however many thousands of dollars each year. Of course. And you can take a trip on any of their boats. And they have about a half a dozen of those boats in the marina where we operate in Naples. So oh. that's, you know, gotten to chat with them a little bit. And they have about 25 or 30 ports that go up and down the eastern seaboard from the Keys all the way up to Bar Harbor, Maine. Wow. And then they're they're out in uh, the Great Lakes as well. So, you know, there's a part of me that sees La Gondola becoming, you know, we becoming the Gondola Baron of the eastern seaboard, you know. Yeah. There's Naples and there's maybe another place in northern Florida and savannah georgia and charleston south carolina and then around dc and you know jersey shore hampton providence boston and then they just shift the boats and the captains and they move up the coast or down the coast depending upon the time of the year right sure it's like this is brilliant you only need half the boats you know just keep moving them up and down yeah but then you know my kids are six and three and ah uh. You know, spending time with them is like an addiction for me. Good. So I um, I think the long and short of it is I love, I'm thrilled that we started in Naples. Oh my word, I'm so happy not to be in New England from January to April. Yeah. <laughs> and, but I think that for the foreseeable future, it's just going to be Providence and Naples. And, yeah. you know, and then we'll take two months off November to work on the boats and December to spend time with our families before we head south for the winter. And, you know, I'll spend as much time as I can watch my kids grow. And nice yeah. good investment. Yep, exactly. It's the right choice. It really is. What kind of upkeep do the boats need? Uh, well, we're definitely finding that the sun in Florida. Oh, yeah. Brutally destroys black paint. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, it basically took a. Uh, <laughs> glossy paint and made it uh, matte finish by the time we were done. <laughs> so each year they get painted twice, basically. So sure. coming up to Providence, we have them in the water, but we're going to be pulling them one at a time to as we launch other boats. Um, so just we have to sand them down, you know, scuff sand everything. Uh, all of the brass or steel trim gets taken off and scrubbed clean. A new bottom paint, new top coat, put that brass and steel back on, and then they go back in the water. So, gotcha. yeah, it's it's a decent amount of work, but it's not you know months or whatever of work on each boat. If if we're working sure. hard, two people working forty hours in a week can get a boat ready to go if the weather's good. Very cool. That's yeah. not. I mean, there's there's worse things to do. <laughs> yeah, right. You know and. There's something to be said for doing manual labor sometimes in your life. Yes. And, you know, just the Agreed. kind of monotony of sanding a boat back and forth, back mm -hmm. and forth, listening to an audio book or, you know, thinking about solving the world's problems. Yeah. Whatever it is, you know, it's kind of nice when you're always thinking to be able to turn your mind off every once in a while. Totally. Just, which, how do you do that? Because I also know you were a physics teacher. Is there an um, off? <laughs> not really. Only when I'm working on boats. Yeah. <laughs> For all intents and purposes. And even then, I'm usually thinking about something. Sure. But, <laughs> but it's it's good to get to think, you know, about like something that's not necessarily it? related to, to business. You know, I can just think about anything. When sure. I, sure. Something. But yeah, physics... 
it blows physics my mind. was my my one true academic love and... blows my mind <laughs> it's, the, especially because like when you go to school the two classes that everyone knows are like nobody understands this stuff is physics and calculus right and, and you taught it which means you really understood it that's it wild to me <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's and you can't at least for me anyway i couldn't help once i became a physics teacher seeing the world as one big physics problem I bet. And so, you know, all the gondoliers get taught as physics students, kind of whether they like it or not. Yeah. And, you know, like my, my brother was a theater major. So when I was teaching oh, him, it's like, I don't care <laughs> how the boat works. Just tell me what I need to do. That's right. You how know, do I plant my feet? <laughs> right. You know, he's used to a director saying, you need to do this. You need to do that. This is yep. your line. Memorize your line. Do it. Mm -hmm. And so he's like, I need a script. You know, give me my script for what I need to do. Like, yes. Look, there isn't a script. You know, that's, that's not the way it works. So we, uh, <laughs> that's why oh, he dropped man. oars. That's why I fell oh, in the water. My like, my this, brother is, and I, this is what happened. <laughs> holy cow. We are, I, I used to maintain that we got the exact 50% opposite sets of genes. We yeah. <laughs> are not related to each other, even though we have the same parents. Uh, we, yeah. We yeah. We were that different from each other along the way. Same situation. Uh, yeah, he with was mine. A, yeah, he was a theater <laughs> major and I was ended up a physics teacher. And <laughs> that gives you everything you need to know about you know our personalities and yep. you know, the way that our minds work. Yeah, we are we are very different from each other. But for me, yeah, physics, it's just, you know, the beauty of the physical world and the way that everything can fit so neatly into equations and Math problems. Oh man, I used to love it. And I think you would have you would have liked my class. Yeah. If I do say so myself, I made it fun. <laughs> I, hey, I need fun to keep my interest. I'm uh, I'm like your brother. I'm more of the creative uh actor type. <laughs> yeah, and you know, each year I would get the best of the best. And not just, you know, physics is like a, an elective basically now right. in the high school. So you know, I get these great students who weren't necessarily great science students, but, you know, they were great students. But some of them were artsy and some of them were, you know, better at math and some of them were like history. And I, uh, I like to think that I was able to incorporate enough things, you know, to make it enjoyable for everybody. And there's really a lot of opportunity teaching physics to have fun with it, you know, to be on rollerblades teaching, you know, Newton's laws of motion, you know, and sure. All the labs and demonstrations that you possibly can do. And, you know, then there's the math problems and the, the virtual simulations you can do on the computer now. And you know, right. for the art kids, you know, uh, I did the best I could. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Tried your best. Tried your best. Right, right. What kind of homework did you give? Uh, at most, just a couple word problems. Oh, thank God. Yeah, I would have liked yeah. your class. I wouldn't have yeah, done no. those, but I would have. Uh, it's it much bad. more manageable. <laughs> and then you'd have to do lab reports and stuff after we did. Oof. Those, but, yeah. Um, you know what? I would have liked your class. You would not have liked me as a student. <laughs> <laughs> I had a number of those students, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, I remember you know, just there's a few of them that, you know, even after 10 years of being out, you know, I remember all the great students. Sure. But then there are some that I remember <laughs> specifically because they weren't great students, you know, and yeah. one kid was on the hockey team and I mean, terrible student. <laughs> I, I'm not sure how he passed. It was probably, you know, pleading upon my leniency, but That's right. um, to watch him skate was just, you know, he was like a figure skater in hockey skates. I mean, wow. It was just so incredibly graceful. And I'm like, this is physics too. You know, this, right, you yeah. know, and, <laughs> and just try and you, you bring that stuff in, you know, you, you find what it is that a kid is passionate about and you're like, this is how I can relate to you. Yeah. The passion for my subject. Cause there's always a way and a good teacher will always find a way to connect with a student no matter what. I agree. I think that's what makes a good teacher. And I think that's also why standardized testing doesn't work. It's like, oh, th there's it's... no standard of people. You gotta, you gotta meet them where they're at. Right. Yeah. And you know, it, it's tough because you know, it's, 
it's a tug of war. You know, you need yep. to evaluate the kids and you need to try and evaluate le- them in such a manner that the field is level for everybody. But you're right. Every kid is different and they have different ways, you know, multiple intelligences, the way that they learn and the way that they communicate. You know, some kids simply don't take tests well. Yep. And, you know, as long as, you know, I, I feel like standardized tests have a role in education, mm-hmm. as long as they're not the be all and end all of a kid's education. I agree. Is that, and I it agree. causes so much stress. It does. You know? <laughs> Yeah. For kids, for teachers, it, it's just not healthy. I agree. Have you ever given a gondola ride to a previous student? Yes. Absolutely. Oh, cool. Yep. When the worlds start colliding. Yo, oh, yeah. And <laughs> and they all knew that I was a physics, they, they all knew that I was a gondolier, you know, oh, as cool. well as a physics teacher. So, but what's actually been really fun is the way that we're all still connected. You know, I've been out of teaching for 11 years Mm -hmm. and I still run into kids on the boat and they might not even, they might not remember by then, Sure, but then they do or friends of them. You know, we realize that we have a common connection and, you know, Rhode Island is a pretty small state and, you know, there are bumper stickers that say I never leave Rhode Island and they're pretty popular (laughs) and which is kind of cringeworthy, but yeah. um, You know, as a result, not just on the boat, but all over, you know, my brother's mother-in-law had physical therapy and somehow they end up on the subject of gondolas. And he said, you know, my physics teacher was a gondolier. <laughs> and so it ter- turns out that, you know, the physical therapist for my brother's mother-in-law was a kid that I had at school, you know? And wow. so, yeah, you know, it just kind of, it's, it's a conversation starter. And so, yeah. you know, regardless of where that conversation happens, quite often we can end up, you know, with a common thread. You know, there's, I think, only two degrees of separation for all Rhode Islanders. So <laughs> we, we find out pretty quickly and easily how connected we all are down here, up here. Sure. It, it's a small world. I'm constantly reminded of that, of talking to so many different kinds of people. It's yeah. th- there's very few degrees of separation from anybody. <laughs> I could absolutely see that, you know, based on what you're doing with the, with the podcast. It's um, wild. Has there, has there been something? Cause you went, you started as a gondolier as like somebody who worked and then eventually you became the boss. Did it change yep. the, like how you saw things when you had to take on like the responsibility of being a business owner? Absolutely. I, yeah. I tell people, I became a gond. I bought a gondola business because I wanted to be gondolier forever, and it's turned out to be a lot more complicated than that. Yeah, <laughs> and always is. Oh yeah, and it was much easier, like, to be a teacher and to be an employee rather sure. than to be a teacher and to be a small business owner. And it's an interesting dichotomy, also, the work that I do, because you know, on the boat, we are servants. And right. as a servant, it's easy to be an employee, but it's kind of interesting to be the servant and the boss at the same time. Sure. You know? So having to kind of like bark orders out to, to gondoliers, you know, as we go by or something like that. But at the same time, you know, being the servant to the people that I have on board. Right. That's, that's having right. a just foot kind in of both worlds. Right. Yeah. A foot in both worlds. That's exactly it. And it's so like, it seems from this side of the oar <laughs> that <laughs> when you're in the boat, it's a creative sort of in the moment feeling what's around and then living in that space. Whereas a business owner, there's so much forward thinking you have to do that. Absolutely. I, I guess it's good. You have a, a pretty good right brain as well. Yes, it is. It's worked good. out. You know, the rowing, getting to step on that boat and just, you know, chill out and relax that is my therapy yeah and you know as stressed out as i might be because of all the small business stuff that i had to do that day or didn't get to do that day which is more often what happens um at least i get to step on my reward is that i get to step on that boat and all my cares just dissolve away you know 
sure. the motion of the oar through the water and you know the interaction with people and i've always been able to same with same with school for one reason or another i've always been able to compartmentalize my life smart in that as soon as i stepped into school i was a teacher and i wasn't anything else and anything that was going on outside of school did not matter and same thing with being on the boat whenever i am on the boat i am a gondolier and i don't even like for people to know that I'm the owner. I mean, I'm not afraid of saying it, sure. you know, if it comes up, but I'd much rather that I simply be a gondolier because that's all that I am. And I'm focused hundred percent on them and not thinking about, you know, the mountains of emails that I should be answering or, <laughs> you know, the phone that's going unanswered right now also. And, you know, that sort of thing. Sure. It's part of, you know, that being a servant mentality. Yeah. Know? The, the devotion to the people that you have on board. Totally. And it shows as somebody who's been a passenger on your gondolier, it is a, a gondola, gondola. You're the gondolier. It's yep. a, it's, it's like, um, you can feel the care that goes into it. And I think that's really important. I think that's what sets it apart from everything else is like you're present, which is a good skill to have that. I feel like a lot of people struggle with is being present in the moment. Like this is what we have. It's pretty cool. Thank you. I appreciate it. What brought you to Naples of all places? <laughs> so I bought out my old bosses up mm -hmm. north 14 years ago. So I started rowing in 99. I bought them out in 07. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say I've been looking longingly to the south for like six or seven years. Mm -hmm. and just getting colder and colder in the winter and more and more <laughs> miserable as a result and i just i can't stand it anymore and i don't blame you so the possibility was always there my wife works from home so it's just really what makes the whole thing possible obviously totally. i only work seasonally up north so you know we could bring boats down south and really not you know uproot things too much it's just it was just the girls and Right. When we were first looking at this, it was about five years ago. And we went down and we specifically looked at Southwest Florida because um, we had visited a number of times. My father in law has a house in Bonita Springs. Uh, uh, actually, okay. That's the house where we were, where we live when we're down there. Oh, cool. We rented from them. And so we wanted to ideally be commuting distance from Bonita Springs. So that basically like Naples to Fort Myers. Right. And we did our due diligence. We looked at a number of places, you know, Naples, uh, where we are. We looked at Venetian Village, um, nice. Sarasota, Clearwater. We were in Venice for a hot minute, um, all the way up to Newport Ritchie. Oh, wow. But Naples is just different. It is. You know, it's like an oasis. and. You know, it has this great food culture, which Providence also has, you know, so a place where we could tell people, you know, you want to go someplace, well, tell us what you like, you know, we'll point you there. And, um, you know, it has culture, you know, it has a, a lot of art galleries and, you know, they have the opera and, you know, there's a lot of things that make Naples just this really high class place to be. And... So yeah, if all things being ideal, we'd like to have been there. And then kind of independently of our looking, we were contacted by the resort where you you met us for your trip. Oh. Um, their concierge, independent of us, in a planning meeting, had come up with the idea for having gondolas during high season to kind of go with the Mediterranean vibe that they were trying to build uh, in their resort. Right. So, you know, she starts doing some Googling and eventually finds the head of the Gondola Society of America, who's out in Newport Beach, California, Gondola Greg. If you need anything nice. gondola related in America, you talk to Gondola Greg. Fantastic and, name. Yeah, right. <laughs> and he, you know, he says, it sounds like a fantastic idea, but, you know, I'm in California, 3,000 miles away and we operate year round. So, you know, I really can't help you, but you should talk to Marcello because I was just chatting with him 
oh. and I know that he wants to bring gondolas down to Florida. So he was the one who connected the two of us. And so all things being equal, we knew that the resort wanted us and we wanted to be in Naples. So we looked at other places, but honestly, that place where we are operating is the best one for a number of reasons. And they've been fantastic. It's, it's been a great partnership already for two seasons, and I'm hoping to be there for a very long time to come. Wow. What are the odds? Right. What are right. the odds? <laughs> you know, and, you know, I, you know that I, I go to church. I'm a, you know, I'm, I was singing in choirs for years. I've been yeah, singing totally. solo in church for, for 15 years, close to it now. I cannot but have faith because Absolutely. everything that I have ever needed has always come to me when I've needed it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I am, I am not Job. I have not been tested you know, <laughs> over and over, you know, afflicted with whatever. I don't think I, you want to be. <laughs> yeah, No, I don't. But I have been very, very blessed. And I am very cognizant of the fact that I am a very taken care of individual. Yeah. So, that's so cool. I, I love hearing stories day. like that. Oh, yeah. And, and there are story after story about that sort of thing. Uh, the way that I became a gondolier, the way that I, you know, ended up in Florida, the way that I ended up taking over the company, you know, the way that I met my wife. Um, you know, every yeah. every time I hear about somebody else's parents, I thank God that I got the parents that I have, which was, you know, was yes. basically like growing up in Beaver Cleaverville. Hell, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. That's so cool. I love that's the big one of the biggest joys I get from like talking to people and like hearing their life stories and stuff like that is being able to connect the dots. Like, oh, like your mom went to a job fair and then you found your dream job like yep. that perfectly suited you. Like, what are the odds? You right. know, it's it's so cool. Right. I and love it. I'm a firm believer in simply going where you're led. And, yes. Absolutely. You know, if you if you follow those dots then you'll end up, I think, where you're supposed to be. And I think so too. It's certainly worked for me in my life, at least so far. I think so too. I think so too. My uh, my mentor, uh, he used to say, if there's something burning in your heart, it's there on purpose. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. It's just cool to see it come to fruition. I'm a big fan. Yeah. I'm a big fan. In and as someone who's been on your gondola, it's a really cool experience that, you just would never know. It's right there. But then when you go to it, you end up with a guest on your podcast. It's really cool. Exactly. You know, and, you know, for me too, you know, for you to say, you know, hey, I, I run this, this interesting podcast, you know, and I'd love for you to join me. And, you know, I was listening to the, you know, a number of the episodes and I'm like, I'm not sure if this is really going to be the <laughs> right thing for me. I, it, <laughs> these people all sound like a lot more successful and interesting than I am. But, uh, you know. I'm glad that you found me interesting enough. <laughs> I did. I did. I'm so excited that you actually came on because, dude, we did an hour. You survived. Nice. All right. Look Made at it that. Hour. This was yeah. so fun. I'm so glad you agreed. <laughs> me too. Well, I'm so glad that you asked. You know, of course. Of course. It's really great. You didn't give me much of a choice being so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, dude, before I let you go, I got to ask, where can people find you online? Where can they find La Gondola? Talk to me. Sure. So there, I mean, the companies are separate, so there's a number of pieces of information here. So, sure. but it is easy. So gondola fl.com is the Naples operation. Gondola ri.com is the Providence operation. And when one is out of season, it will have a pop-up pointing you to the other one. Um, so there's that Instagram at la gondola prov at la gondola Naples well if you want to follow us on facebook same thing and yeah that's it it's uh just come on down if you're in either place january through april in florida may through october in rhode island just living the dream that's right get on it i highly recommend it i did it and it was great dude thanks so much this was a <laughs> thank joy. you so much anytime anytime and
Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at BrianBalance.com. There you'll find all my demos and a bunch of other fun stuff. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps and is greatly appreciated. Let the people know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch! Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to get you some sweet gear. Also, I've got a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show more directly, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, Daryl, Xavier, and Victor. Your support means so, so much, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.